So, I just listed uh, some of the ionization curves. So, here obviously this can be replaced with energy, but then the nature of the curve will change, it will become exponential decay. Now, if you put the temperature in this curve, nitrogen has the very highest ionization potential, the sodium, potassium, they have very low ionization potential. So, that is why you always create the sodium ions and the potassium ions much easily. Whereas, if you want to create N plus, the temperature has to go much higher because of the very high ionization potential, ionization energy needed to ionize the nitrogen oxygen for example, in this case. Okay. Similar the same case for 0.5 or 50 percent ionization, it can never happen for nitrogen at the temperatures of about 7000 Kelvin. So, system temperature should be increased close to 60,000 Kelvin, yes. So, then only you will can ionize, then only you can have sustained discharge, is not it? Otherwise, you will arc will extinguish, right? It is clear. So, that is how we need to heat it up to such temperatures in arc, otherwise you will never have sustained discharge. Yes, clear. So, these are the shielding gases we use, nitrogen, okay, oxygen, helium, argon and each shielding gas is as its own unique ionization values, potentials, right. So, obviously, the temperature of the arc will also change as a function of the shielding gases. Okay, so, the selection of shielding gas can also, will also influence definitely your heat generation because of this very specific reason. reason. Okay, so, you can choose uh, whatever shielding gas you want, but obviously, you will also change the arc temperature. Okay. And before going to look at the shielding gas, so, moment you st strike an arc using a shielding gas, for example, use a helium as a shielding gas. Okay. You have uh, for example, a, a simple tungsten electrode which supplies energy for initial ionization. <coughs> Thermionic emission is happening, electrons are released from the cathode okay, and they are going to the, the arc column and R column in this case for example, you make it with uh, helium. The moment electrons reach helium regions, obviously once the electrons which are actually emitted from the cathode gains the ionization energy required for knocking out electron from helium, the electron will be knocked out from helium, right. And then the charges, the space charges will be conducted because of the subsequent avalanche of these ionization from the tip of the cathode to anode. Then what will happen? You strike an arc, right. So, then discharge can be sustained because of the ionization process, okay. The ignition is by thermionic emission. The moment ignition happens, the electrons reach the gas medium. Upon gaining the energy E i, the ionization energy, the electrons are knocked out creating an helium ions. In this process, you create an avalanche of these reactions. The moment you have the enough charge carriers developed, you will have conduction of these charge carriers from cathode to anode. Then you strike an arc. Okay, so, the moment you strike an arc, so obviously you also melt, is not it, the anode. So, if you keep your tungsten electrode as a cathode, you will start melting the anode and if the anode is superheated, the molten anode would also vaporize, right. Then you form metal vapors, metal vapors are also gas, subsequently they will also ionize, is not it? Because ion vapor is ion gas, it would also ionize. But if you look at the ionization energy of these metal vapors, 
they are much much lower than the inert gases you use is not it. So, for example, you are welding an, an, an iron steel the iron vapors the ionization energy of iron vapor is much much lower than the shielding gas you use either helium or argon. So, the moment you create the iron vapor okay, and then the iron vapor would start subsequently ionize would carry forward this uh, discharge okay, because iron is easy to vaporize is not it. Similarly, if you are doing welding in aluminum the moment you create aluminum vapor aluminum would ionize much easily at much lower temperature than helium and argon. So, aluminum vapors can supply the electrons needed for the sustained discharge okay. So, that is what I showed in this graph. So, for example, if you have an helium and argon shielding and that is actually used for arc ignition the moment you create arc ignite an arc you start vaporizing the metal then subsequently these metal vapors would ionize and the, the ionization of metal vapor would be rate controlling okay. So, that is what when you are doing welding the, when the arc ignition is happening the arc is really hotter when the arc is ignited okay because when the at the ignition point you are ionizing the shielding gas which should be either argon or helium. Now, upon ignition once you start creating enough supply of metal vapor okay and then your metal vapor would determine the arc temperature is clear is it clear or not. So, if you look at in a real welding case the metal vapor would dictate the electrical field therefore, the temperature. So, during ignition okay your shielding gas would ionize and then arc is ignited the moment you have enough vapor is generated metal vapor is generated because of the ionization energy of the metal vapors are much lower than the, the inert gases the metal vapor would supply the electrons needed to carry forward the, the electrical field in the arc. So, that is what when you are doing a an, an, an welding of a steel or aluminum the arc temperature is much lower when you have a plasma state okay. So, by say for example, you creating with argon because argon is inert the ionization is so energy energy is so high the, the temperature of arc by pure argon will be much higher than when you are welding with the shielding gas of argon okay. You may use this gas shielding gas of an argon, but ultimately the arc is sustained by the ionization of the metal vapor okay. So, in argon uh, case when you have a shielding gas and the, the, the cath anode is not molten you have a the, the figure I showed you. So, in this case and this is the experiment was carried out with water cooled copper plate that means that you are not vaporizing copper here okay. That means that the arc here is fully created by the ionization of argon okay. So, if you are not melting the anode and then vaporizing and you can know that exactly the temperature of uh, the arc only by argon. So, that is how the temperatures are much higher okay. Suppose, if you are va start vaporizing this anode you would the temperature would drastically come down. So, the arc column the temperature will be not more than 10,000 Kelvin and envelope will be close to 5000 Kelvin in a real welding case where you are welding a metal or alloy okay because in that case the metal vapor would determine your arc temperature yes it is clear. So, the, the lesson here is so when you have gases with the very high energy and energy your arc temperature will also be high right because obviously, if you want to ionize the inert gases you need to supply more energy and that can happen only at higher temperatures compared to a gases which has low ionization energy okay. So, this is extremely important in welding case because 
that will determine your choice of the sealing gas plus the arc temperature would also be determined by the metal vapor you generate. Right? It is clear? So, that is what I want to tell you with this slide that if you look at, uh, at 5000 Kelvin, you will see that ion vapor would completely ionize. Okay? Whereas, in argon or 5000 Kelvin hardly ionized, okay, 10 power minus 7, very few atoms are ionized. So, then what is red controlling here? Metal vapor, ion vapor, is not it? It is clear? So, once ion ionizes, the ion vapor ionizes, obviously you have sustained discharge. The electrons that we need, electrons and ions, whatever it be, if the charge carriers are transported from one uh, say cathode to anode, so you strike an arc, arc is sustained. Does not matter, you need to create only with argon or helium, as long as you have a gas. In this case, it is uh, metal gas, metal vapor. Yeah, it is clear? Good. So, I just tabulated uh, the, uh, the ionization energy of various elements. And if you, if you look at it, obviously helium, the electron volt is the maximum 24.6. And if you look at the helium is 24.6, the argon, okay, we have argon here, yes, 50.8. And if you look at the metals that are very low, copper for example, 7.7, .7, okay, one third of uh, helium, close to one third. Right, and if you look at uh, the aluminium, it's much lower as well. So therefore, when you have metal vapor, so obviously you can ionize them easily at lower temperatures. Yes, it's clear. So the fundamentals of choosing a sealing gas is derived from these physics. Okay, it is not like randomly you can go and okay, I will, I will weld with argon or helium. Okay. Because you have argon, you can't just like that go and choose argon and weld. Because your uh, the arc temperature would also determine by the ionization. Okay, so the the, the principles of cho choosing sealing gas is all determined by the physics governed in this sustained dis uh, discharge. Okay, similarly, if you mix it with the two gases, obviously that will also affect the temperature of the arc because the ionization will be changed. Right, so clear. So apart from the the atomic ionization, sometimes you may also have a, a diatomic gases or molecular gases. Okay, that also you can use sometimes during welding, isn't it? For example, uh, O two or N two or even CO two, for example. Okay, sometimes you also use diatomic hydrogen, hydrogen molecule. So then, if you use such gases, 